Welcome, welcome. Happy Thursday night. If you know me well, you know how special this live is tonight for me. It is not the first time that I've talked about Dr. Tom Coquit and how he is the one, the responsible one for me being here right now. Uh, he introduced me to Airway during a lecture at the Hinman in Atlanta several years ago. So I want to start just by saying thank you so much for all the years and everything that you have done for this field and for, for all of us and for all these patients that have been impacted by you going out there and you sharing um, all of this information. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. I assure you it's my pleasure. I've had so many uh, people who have taught me, you know, they say when the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear, and Dave McCarty's one of them. He, oh, uh, my. He brought me into uh, institutionalized sleep medicine when I really needed to know about it. And all these people I'm going to show you here today, they just, they're 10 times smarter than I am, and they happen to show up and gratefully and uh, graciously taught me what we needed to know to try to put together all the incredible pieces of this puzzle. So to have a chance, and those of you who are here realize disordered breathing and its consequences is the number one public health issue in this country. And it's largely an undiagnosed pandemic. Virtually half of everybody you know has problems with this. And yet, it seems to have fallen in the lap of dentistry more than medicine to go beyond just diagnosing and treating the end stage of obstructive sleep apnea. So what I've learned from all these people has certainly changed my life. And treating myself, which I want to show first, made me realize that not only do we just have to manage people so they can sleep better now, maybe we can get at the upstream causes of why they're sick, address those, and actually let them cure themselves. Right. So to be able to oh. go first do that, and I want to show first what I did to myself because I thought it wouldn't work. It made me realize <laughs> that it doesn't matter how old you are, we can we can right the ship. So to have any opportunity to talk about this is just great for me because I'm not going to be around long. And the beauty is we have young leaders like you who, once us old farts have passed, you're going to push this forward until it becomes a standard of health care in this country. We hope so. But before you start, I do want to read your bio really quickly because it's so important for people to know who you are. Uh, with 52 years of experience in the field, Dr. Colquitt is a highly respected and experienced dentist with a focus on airway center dentistry. He has held leadership positions, and you, can, you guys can hear Ben in the background, as past president of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry and the International Academy of Nathology and has contributed to the field as a faculty member in the sleep medicine department at LSU Medical School. In addition, Dr. Colquitt has published articles and produced videos on airway and restorative dentistry. We are thrilled to have him share his insights and expertise on the topic of the eyes have it, as he discusses the role of the eyes in assessing airway health and the potential impact of airway issues on overall health. The floor is yours. Well, good God. Thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, all right. If, if, am I on the screen here? Is my, I'm screen sharing. Am I there? You can see it. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> well, guess what? It won't let me change slides. Uh, okay. We didn't try that, did we? Oh, All right, there you I, go. <laughs> I'll do it this way. This will work. Uh, here's a little quotation. Or late to bed and early to rise puts big black bags under your eyes. It makes you forget about how old sayings go. So we're going to talk about the big black bags under the eyes. We're going to talk about what we can see with our own eyes, which is what Dave is brilliant at doing. Is to uh, we'll show a cartoon of his uh, later, where the guy is, the doctor is seeing a new patient, and you can tell just by looking at the patient what's wrong with him. And yet the doctor is holding up a chart and saying, what seems to be the problem? Because he's not looking. He's not looking at the patients. And by the time you see a patient walk down the hall, see their posture, sit, them, sit, sit in your chair, you turn around and look at their face before they even open their mouth, you know what questions to ask them if you know what to look for. 
And so we want to talk about that and talk about the uh, many things that have to do with eyes. So this is, these are my eyes before and after I treated myself. Is there any way I can get rid of this viewer screen sharing thing on the top here? Uh, I not. think you can move it. I think you can move it if you can hold it. You might be able to move it around so it's not in your way. Yeah, it's just going to be, let me move it to the bottom. Okay. So uh, uh, Dave and Ted Belfour uh, and, and Michael have just, this will be the first, I think, Dave, you'll have to tell me if I'm right about this. The first time in a medical journal that the using dental appliances has been shown to be able to regrow uh cranial bones in an adult and to change the uh, face. Other than the maxilla to change the conformation of bones in relationship to one another, other than the maxilla, we all kind of are talking about it, but this is the first one that we're trying to get into the peer reviewed literature that shows it and has the bony changes. Right. And interestingly, in the article, you can see, if you look at left and right, the one on the left is two years before the one on the right. And yet, I would think if you look at that, the one on the right looks a little younger than the one on the left. So I think we had some success with this treatment. Interestingly, in the article, it says I presented with a complaint of facial uh, asymmetry. Well, that, that wasn't my complaint. My complaint was I was sick as hell and I wanted to be better. And I realized the way I was breathing, chewing, and swallowing, it led to a lifetime of being sick. So this... Uh, Treated myself, and we'll get into the history of how I got there uh, and the people who've helped me get there. So I treated myself for uh, two years, starting eight years ago, and then the Restorative Academy asked me to present this case of my treatment, which I did six years ago, and it's also on YouTube. So this is my personal journey from chronic inflammatory disease to wellness, or a case history of my life from birth to 70 years old. My father built this building in 1953. He practiced dentistry for 60 years. I don't know how the hell he did that. I managed to make it 52 years. Uh, last year we sold the building and I'm in a wonderful new office where I don't have to do anything but show up and it's great. And uh, two days a week or so, we help people who can't breathe, chew and swallow. So no longer practicing restorative dentistry. Although it was a great career, but what we have now is uh, a calling. It's just a black hole I've fallen in and I can't get out and I'm not trying to. So we have a lot of slides to show. I'll try not to go too fast. Uh, if you want to go look at some of the stuff we've done, these are four YouTube videos. Three of them are six hours I did for the AOMT that kind of go into great detail of all the things I cannot go into great deal, detail about tonight. So you can find these on YouTube just under my name. And I've showed you my email address. If any of you have questions, go ahead and email me. So my great privilege was being raised by this gentleman, Walter Cockwood. He was a giant leader in dentistry. And unlike me, he was a humble Southern gentleman. But he also was a rabble rouser and recognized bullshit when he saw it. And if he ever saw opened his mind to see that there was a better way to do something. He pursued that. So this handwritten note you see here is where he introduced to dentistry in 1950, uh, the use of elastic compression materials so that a laboratory technician could actually make crowns in the laboratory instead of making them in the mouth. He also was practicing endodontics when it was considered a crime and became uh, a diplomat of the board of endodontics and a leader in that field, published many articles about why this was a legitimate way to save teeth. And he was very involved in uh, conservative periodontics too. So he was all over the map in trying to change our profession to what was better. And I guess it just kind of rubbed off on me. So he has some great quotes about how to think that inform what we've been through and what you're all going through as we deal with the fact that we're trying to produce new ideas. Actually, they're not new ideas. They're finally coming back. But we're, we're trying to present them to people who haven't heard it and they may not want to hear it. 
as Will Rogers said, it's hard to get a feller to listen to you when his salary depends on his not hearing it. So the first is your intellectual age is inversely proportional to the degree of pain you experience on hearing a new idea. In other words, if it, if it hurts a lot to hear something new, maybe you're just not mature intellectually. He said, is there any way I can get rid of the uh, column on the right side that has the, the videos on it? Because it's intruding on my slides. Or is that, I might uh, stuck so there. Uh, Dr. Colquitt, uh, you might not be able to see them as as well. We have no problem seeing them. However, if you okay, if you can see up, them, I'll just have to okay. pretend I know what it says. Yeah, so <laughs> you can also click on view, and if uh, there's the word view on the upper right corner, and if you yeah, click I on might that, screw things up. I'll just okay, it. <laughs> okay, sounds uh, good. Thanks. And, he said, and I show this to people all the time, especially if they come in patients with a something we just can't diagnose right now no matter how hard we try. And Daddy said the problem will eventually become so obvious that even the dentist will be able to tell what's wrong. And so sometimes we have to delay diagnosis until we can tell what's wrong. And it's interesting that dentistry, I firmly believe, as opposed to our medical colleagues with whom we need to bond right now, I think we have a lot bigger handle on this problem uh, than MDs do at this point, because it's become obvious to dentistry. And he said the best way to know when you're wrong is when everybody agrees with you. Oscar Oliver Wendell Holmes said, a mind when stretched to a new idea never returns to its former dimensions. And the way daddy put that was, too many minds are like concrete, all mixed up and permanently set. So these are things we all deal with every day in trying to not only educate our own patients so that they can understand uh, as Dave would say, to be empowered, to know what their problems are, to be educated, to know how to work with our direction so they can heal themselves. Oops. Oh, how do I go back? There we go. Are these are people who've really influenced me. Jack Swift and Bill McCars and Bob Fidal were great restorative dentists. I think Bob's still living. Bill McCarris was the giant in nathology. And these are the ones who really taught me the fine details of trying to do the best dentistry in the world. And then Mark Cruz, who is also a nathological dentist, is the one who got me connected between all the things we knew about the nathostomatic system and then adding in breathing, chewing, and swallowing to that. Because in, in the old days, we weren't looking at any of that. Maybe mastication a little bit. This is Keith Thornton, who uh, is really the father of sleep, uh, dental sleep medicine. He invented this TAP-1 appliance up here in the 90s. That was the first one we did. All of these appliances he has are just excellent. We were fortunate to help him develop many of them. Um, and he's just like a brother to me. So we continue to move forward together. And then in the world of airway, when I finally started, quit going to dental meetings and started just learning this. If I'm going to spend money on CE, this is where I want to do it. <clears throat> so I took courses from Mark and Barry and got to know Kevin Boyd. All of you know who Kevin is, especially any of you who treat children. They're just giants. And then there's Ted Belfour, who invented the homeo blocks with another guy whose name I won't mention, but he wears a turban. Uh, Scott Simonetti, who practiced with uh, with Ted uh, and came up with a preventive oral device with a pod, which is my go-to appliance for starting with every patient now because it's inexpensive. It cannot create permanent bite problems, and it has a whole wealth of opportunities uh, to help patients get better by giving them more room for their tongue. And then Roger Price... <clears throat> who has taught me so many things, who basically helped me understand breathing and especially the role of carbon dioxide. You know, we look at oximetry all the time. We're looking at oxygen. We're always talking about SpO2, uh, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in our body and blood is incredibly important too. And if you breathe through your mouth, you breathe out too much carbon dioxide and it makes you sick and it damn near killed me. And we're gonna talk about that. But Roger helped me understand part of why I was so sick. 
So the, the most important muscles in our body are the heart, the diaphragm, and the tongue. And the tongue runs the show. The tongue is the most, it's the, the rudder of our existence. And as they say in the South, uh, in the world of airway, the tongue is your mama. And if, if your tongue ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So it's problems with dysfunction of what the tongue does to develop our, our airway and to control all the functions of life that basically influences all the problems we're looking at now. That's simplistic, but that has to do with the development of all these structures. This is the, fortunately, Kevin Boyd gave us this great term because we never really had a good term to describe all of these structures and how they work together as a unit. So it's the craniofacial respiratory complex. And the tongue is largely involved in developing it and maintaining it. So this is the closest thing to a profound statement I can make. The infant's tongue, left to its own natural devices, will conduct the proper growth and development of the structures of the craniofacial respiratory complex. In other words, if you breastfeed enough time and you transition baby-laid weaning to solid food, then it's going to, the tongue, along with all these other functions, is going to grow that, that complex. If the tongue can't do that, if you, if you don't breastfeed, if you've got a restricted tongue, if the baby never learns to eat hard food, then those things don't happen. And that's why we're here today, is to deal with what doesn't happen. How we can try to fix it in old broken adults, and how we can try to avoid it by treating kids when they're young. That's a two to seven. That's our target audience. And once it's done that, then it, the tongue will conduct for a lifetime the multiple functions required to fulfill the nutritive, communicative, and air conditioning needs of the entire human organism. In other words, it runs the business of life. All the things we need to stay alive and healthy, including social interaction by being able to speak. So in short, the tongue has to develop its own functional space, which I call a linguatorium. If the tongue is conducting the business of life, an orchestra conductor needs an auditorium. If the tongue is conducting it, it needs a linguatorium. It needs this huge space, which is basically the size of the tongue because the tongue develops, develops it or should develop it. But if we see this high vaulted palette like this, we have an inadequate linguatorium and there's not going to be enough room for this diseased, uh, that's a, a the only tongue picture I could find to try to fit in there, that's a geographic tongue. And it, it, the other muscles also, if you look at the diagnostic cast, we had a hard time getting an impression right here because this patient is not only a mouth breather, he chews using his facial muscles. And so he's got all these hypertonic muscles here that make it hard to even get an impression. And when we look from the di distal and look at this linguatorium, it just looks like he needs somebody to go in there and spread that for him. And of course, it should have happened uh, in the first months of life. So my young tongue never achieved its genetically prescribed goal. I did not have a restricted tongue. I had a dumb tongue because my mother had two older kids and she wasn't about to breastfeed me. So the result was a lifetime of mouth breathing, poor posture, and chronic inflammatory disease. So what I'm giving you here are my confessions of a recovering mouth breather. Over the past 24 years, my trajectory has been, uh, 1999 got interested in dental sleep medicine, started making tap appliances to treat what we call then, and still people do, sleep disordered breathing. And I joined the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. Uh, I don't have a lot good to say about that because it, they really wanted to restrict access to its own diplomates instead of spreading uh, universal access to this. But that's just me. I don't like politics. Dave was kind enough to bring me onto the sleep medical medicine faculty at LSU Medical School for a number of years where I learned an awful lot about sleep and was able to uh, lecture to the, to the residents. And finally, I'm, next month, we'll start back doing this again. But what we were doing then was basically dealing with oral appliances and CPAPs 
which are airway management strategies, management for obstructive sleep apnea. So we were really looking at people who quit breathing 10 times, uh, uh, 10 seconds, five times an hour who qualified to have sleep apnea. And if it was anything below that, even though they may they don't desaturate, but they may be terribly ill, uh, they couldn't be diagnosed as having a treatable reimbursable disorder, which is what really got us looking at younger people and what their problems are. And if the if the uh, medical doctors couldn't help them, then it, these are largely for every apnea patient I see, I see about five of these. And I, and I really started seeing it when I went back and started looking at the patients I've been treating for 40 years and realized how many of them had been suffering the whole time. Never thought to tell me they had these problems. And for the ones who actually uh, were diagnosed with apnea, most of them weren't apneic yet, but they had a lot of symptoms. Uh, upper airway resistance syndrome, uh, flow limitation. Uh, Dave will probably give you a better name for it. So Roger Price pointed out that sleep disordered breathing is a misnomer. It's not a sleep problem. It's a breathing problem. It's a 24 hour a day breathing problem. that's just more significant at night because we have REM sleep, gravity and atonia and everything tends to collapse. So we're much more vulnerable at night. But these people have problems breathing 24 hours a day. They also have problems chewing and swallowing. It's taken me 40 years to figure that out. You have to treat all of it. So understanding how we breathe explains what happens when we can't breathe. Our focus must be to provoke functional breathing 24-7, 365. And I think the first thing every dentist should do for every patient they see the first time they see them is to see how they're breathing. And if they can't breathe, chew and swallow, address that first and then deal with the dentistry. We need to attack the causes to treat the symptoms. The symptoms are not the disease. So we now call our practice airway-centered dentistry. That's what we're doing now. So we've had done an awful lot of thinking and changing as in the experience of trying to figure out for the last couple of decades, first, what's really specifically wrong with these people in terms of growth, development, function, behavior, and then what is, we call it, the walk to wellness. What would Hippocrates do? What is the most conservative approach we can take, irrespective of time, you can't fix this in 90 days, to go one step at a time until we can get this patient where they're well, and ideally not needing any appliances or CPAPs. That's our goal. It's unpredictable, but we've had some pretty good luck with it. So today's take home thought is, it's all about the structure, function and behavior of the tongue, the nose and the diaphragm. It's how we breathe and through what structures we breathe that counts. And when James Nestor started to write his book, he asked his brother-in-law pulmonologist, is there any difference between breathing through your mouth and breathing through your nose? And the pulmonologist said, no, they're both the same. And if you're breathing with a CPAP, it's the same too. And none of those have anything in common. So we need to think about that and think about what were we hardwired to do for 250,000 years that produced full faces, big cheekbones, no impacted wisdom teeth, no deviated septums. What's happened where that isn't happening anymore? So are there significant differences between mouth breathing and nasodiaphragmatic breathing? Well, first, basic breathing. What is it? You, you breathe in, you breathe out. You're exchanging gases. So for a lot of people, the only thing they'll think about gas exchange is where they go refill their propane tank. And if you ask them about breathing, uh, they'll say, well, you take in oxygen, put carbon dioxide out. That's all there is to it. Well, yes, but no. If you breathe in through your nose, you get nitric oxide but you only get it through your nose because it's secreted by your paranasal sinuses. And we could talk a whole hour on nitric oxide, but basically it keeps us well, it keeps us from being sick, and it puts a lot more oxygen in our bloodstream than if you're breathing through your mouth. If you're breathing through your mouth, you don't get the nitric oxide, plus you get unfiltered air. So all the, all the uh, 
pathogens you're breathing in don't get killed and they end up in your lungs or your throat. If you breathe out through your nose, it protects the pH of your blood by maintaining the partial pressure of CO2 in your bloodstream, which is incredibly important. Oral expiration frequently does not. If you breathe like I did, like this all night, you breathe so much carbon dioxide out that first it starts screwing up your blood pH, and then it wants to constrict any tubes in your body, and then it makes you quit breathing, and that's central apnea, where you, you're, you're not having any, any uh, respiratory effort going on. Your brain says, you have got to quit breathing until you get more carbon dioxide up. So you're going hypoxic because you breathe out too much carbon dioxide. So there's a big difference between nasal breathing. So here's my life story that shows how mouth breathing makes us sick from the cradle to grave and may kill us before our time, whether or not we have obstructive sleep apnea, just the danger of mouth breathing. So here I am in 1946. I'm gonna go through these pretty damn fast and it will show different stages in my life where I started getting sick. Don't focus too much on those symptoms because when we get up to where I finally decided to do something about this, I will have a list of the things that happened to me uh, for 60 years uh, due to the way I was breathing. But here you can see my mouth's open. There's snot running out of my nose, running out of my mouth. I got circles under my eyes. I'm not even a year old there. There's a baby trying to sleep with sleep apnea. Look at that position. And there's my position. And if you look at that face, that's a sick, tired baby. I mean, I was sick from day one. And I can't find any pictures of me as a baby where my mouth was closed. Never see a picture where I apparently was breathing through my nose. So we've got genetic factors and epigenetic factors. The genetic factors is we may inhale and uh, inherit the profile of our parents. If you look at my mother and me, look at my father and me, everybody's kind of chinless. So I was probably doomed to have that. There's an overbite with class two. And if you start out with that at age three, you're gonna have it at age 50 too. And if you've got it at age 50, you've probably got a tongue that's got a, a small linguatorium. It's the back of your tongue is jammed up against your oral pharynx, and you got serious breathing problems. And you'll end up looking like this, where the, and this is the profile, the, the uh, phenotype we're seeing now in all kinds of kids, and especially kids who've had four bicuspids taken out. These kids showed up with crowded teeth, and so instead of growing the face to make room for the teeth, they took out even more teeth. And to me, that's a crime. It should never happen again. You know, orthodontists have been doing this for 70 years with no science to back it up. They need to quit doing it. They need to start treating three-year-olds. All right, by then I'm already sick. I've got sinus infections. I'm taking uh, uh, antihistamines every day and have my sinuses pumped out about twice a month. So you'll start seeing this these problems with mouth breathing everywhere, you'll see it in your patients, you'll see it in your family, you'll see it in your friends, and you may finally recognize it in yourself, as I do. Here's a picture of me and my grandfather. We got the same phenotype, same facial structures, and he died a few later, years later from that, from Parkinson's disease. And I would guess, Dave, that his glymphatic system wasn't working in, in slow wave sleep. And that had a lot to do with it. Here are four of our grandchildren. Look at the gummy smile here. Both of these kids needed help. And it took me forever to find somebody who would help them. Our other grandson was almost on the spectrum uh, because of his development problems until we finally found somebody who could expand his arches. And now he's, now he's doing great. But, you, if you look in your family, you're going to see this. You're going to see it in your best friends. This, is, this office I'm in was built by my good friend, Joe Beard. And he died from metabolic syndrome and had uh, bad obstructive sleep apnea that wasn't managed. This was at my wedding 
that that's my uh, bachelor party, and that's Rodney Cage, my best friend, who lived in Atlanta, Georgia. And I identified his apnea uh, many years ago, but he died from Parkinson's with Lewy body dementia. Now, if in 1970 I had known what was wrong with these guys, maybe they could still be alive today. You know, you don't want to beat yourself up any more than you have to for what you didn't know, but it will try to help keep you from making those same errors again. And Dave, this is someone you know, the funniest man I've ever known in my life, Clyde Hargrove, who was the leader of our band, the Hubcaps. Dave was our bass player. And he had anxiety and depression from obstructive sleep apnea. We tried to tap, we tried to pod, we tried CPAP, non-compliant. He wouldn't uh, consider having his tongue released to do in myofunctional therapy. And he ended up putting a bullet in his brain. So this is the t-shirt we have of him now. And I really think if when we first became friends, friends 35 years ago, and he was my patient. If I had known what was going on and really pushed it on him, he might be alive today. So once you've seen this, you can't unsee it and you don't want to miss it. So back here, I'm about 12 years old. This is when I started getting obese. And these are pictures when I'm off at prep school and I'm a fat kid and I've got all these different problems going on. Uh, started playing music. Dave, was my first band. Two guitars, no PA, and an electric banjo. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll be popular because today half the kids in school are fat. Back then, I was the fat kid. And you didn't want to be the fat kids in class, especially if you're a year younger than everybody else. So here was what my cartoon for me in the in the my yearbook. And I was known as Baby Huey, which is really it doesn't make you feel too good. When I got to Washington Lee, started playing in the band, I got up 290 pounds and was known as the whale. Fortunately, when I finally got back to Shreveport and started going to school with girls for the first time since the eighth grade, my doctor put me on dexedrine and I starved myself down to 232 pounds. Uh, and I was able to stay between 232 and 245 uh, until I was about 65 years old. But I never did really get down to the weight I wanted. So here's where I met my wife, Ginger, fell in love with her. Fortunately, I wasn't a fat guy then, but it didn't take me long to fatten up because I already had her in the bag. Here we are at the uh, the bachelor party. I start practicing with my father. We start having babies. We have a big family. We go on family vacation and I'm skinny here. And the reason I'm skinny is I got diarrhea every day because I got Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease, uh, if you breathe out too much carbon dioxide, one of the reactions is tubes in your body constrict themselves. Well, that's the string sign. That's how they diagnose Crohn's disease is where the tube in your small intestine squeezes down. So was that related to my breathing? Could have been. And you can see I have started to get this bad posture bent over more and more. And these are my head down and forward to try to keep my airway open. So there's you know, gonna be a lot of pictures of playing music because I don't have a lot of family pictures of me. Here's for about 20 years, kind of holding it together till I had a complete bowel obstruction and they had to take out a foot of my gut. And this was right after that, I lost a lot of weight. Here we are playing on the Delta Queen, and I got to play uh, a Freddie King song for B.B. King, who autographed my guitar for me. So I had just survived almost dying from that surgery. And later on, up through the 50s and 60s here, here I am about 60 years old, overweight, bent over, bad breathing, sick as hell. Here I am the year I was president of the Restorative Academy. That's a sick man. So during these years, I had two rectal fissurotomies that damn near killed me. I had a stroke that made me almost retire. And that's when I was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. So things really weren't going well. So here's that medical history we'll run through 
really quickly. I wasn't breastfed, problem number one. I was fed pureed baby food, problem number two. That's why those things didn't develop correctly. Had all kinds of allergies, skin allergies, chronic sinus infections, antihistamines every day, started gaining weight at age eight, was an anxious, depressed, suicidal teenager. I had acute kidney disease at 13, I had 300 pounds at 18, Crohn's disease at 29, had two blood clots in my legs and put me in the hospital, had two rectal, rectal fissurotomies and almost didn't survive the second one. I had hypertension, congestive heart failure with a low ejection fraction. I did not have obstructed sleep apnea, but I had central apnea. I had a stroke in the 1990s. They tried to get me out of AFib three times. That didn't work, so they ablated my AV node, which has now been ablated three times. And I'm now on my third pacemaker defibrillator. And if it weren't for the incredible medicines for heart failure now, I wouldn't even be here. But I think one of the reasons I'm here is I learned to breathe, chew, and swallow. I lost so much weight that my heart doesn't have to work as hard. Uh, otherwise, I think I'd be long gone. I always had trouble maintaining the weight. The Crohn's disease, my, my belly hurt for 40 years. I had temper mandibular joint problems, headaches, joint noises, locking, had to be equilibrated multiple times, had all kinds of terrible skin problems, including that. That's called Schomburg's purpura. So I was not, I, that's not a really good medical history. So the turning point was when I took a course from Mark Cruz, which when I finally saw the picture between all the chronic inflammatory disease there is and how we breathe and chew and swallow, but basically breathing. And I realized that my health issues were because I couldn't do that, that I needed to change that. And then Ted Belfort showed these homeoblock appliances. And he showed cases where he could regrow faces and airways in adults. And I thought that just can't be done, that, especially with a hunk of acrylic. That can't be done, or may, maybe it can. Let's try that. I mean, what have I got to lose? We don't want to indulge in contempt before investigation. And that's the problem we're running in right now. All of you out there know the value of phrenectomy and OMT. But try to go tell that the National Association of Pediatrics. They, they think it's bullshit because they don't want to hear it. And we're, we're saving lives and changing the trajectories of people's lives. But they have contempt before investigation. They just don't know. So 2014, it's time to get proactive. I'm gonna wear the homie blocks every night. I'm gonna tape my mouth shut so I have to breathe through my nose. I'm gonna advance them a half a turn weekly. I'm gonna make serial photographs every three months by an orthodontic colleague. We're gonna document this just in case it works. Serial impressions. I'm gonna work on uh, retraining my tongue, get it up in the roof of my mouth, get my head back over my shoulders and breathe through my nose with my mouth closed all day. I'm going to attempt to learn to stand up straight by doing different exercises as I improve my breathing. And I'm going to learn how to chew and swallow. I used to choke to death on food. I had to, I had to water, wash things down. And I would always eat probably three times as much food as I should because I just never learned to chew and swallow like an adult. So I, did, I really didn't expect this to do much, but I hoped for the best. And so we made 3D ICAST scans before and after treatment. So these were the homeo blocks. This is Paula Watkins, who was my hygienist for 47 years. She was the first OMT and Buteco instructor in Louisiana. And she did that for seven years until she retired last year. And now, thank God we've got Jennifer. And this is Buteco tape. There are many other types of tape, but if you've got your mouth taped, you're either gonna die or breathe through your nose. And so I really think of half the people who come to see me with complaints, regardless of their complaints, if they can sit in my office with their mouth taped shut for 10 minutes and breathe, then they can go home and do that at night too. And if they can do that at night, once we've given some information, educated them about how important this is, I have many patients who, they get incredibly better in just a week or two. 
just because they were working on getting their head back over their shoulder, getting their tongue in the roof of their mouth, making sure they breathe through their nose at night. So th these are all, as opposed to saying, here, take this machine, take, take this gadget, go home, it's gonna fix your problem. We're trying to help them fix themselves. And this is the lovely Ginger, uh, excuse me, that's my wife, Jennifer, who has taken over. So every night from, this is a selfie, I would spray my nose several times with saline spray, tape my mouth shut, use breathe right nasal strips uh, because I really had trouble getting air through my nose. Ultimately, I grew a bigger nasal capsule and it's not a problem anymore. And then during the daytime, I try to stand up straight. And so I, I remember uh, Alec Guinness from Bridge Over the River Choir. And if you look at Alec Guinness, he was basically a bent over mouth breathing guy, but he wanted to look military. So he kept his hands behind him like that, made him stand up straight. So that was the first exercise I did. If you use both hands, it's the full Guinness. If it's just one hand, you're the half Guinness. But it's a way when you're walking to start stabilizing your posture until it becomes normal. So let's look at the CT scan. There are three things to look at. If you look at this green line, this line should be about 95 millimeters. In me, it's about 86. So I'm underdeveloped in the maxilla, almost a centimeter. And that's why the hard palate is short and why the soft palate is way back here trying to obstruct me. If you look here, you can see I had this low tongue posture because my tongue never learned where to, where to live. You know, the main job of a fire engine is 90% of the time to be parked in its garage. It only comes out to do duty. <clears throat> Your tongue should be parked in its garage 90% of the time. And it should only move away from that with your mouth open when you're eating, chewing, uh, eating or uh, speaking, chewing and swallowing and the mouth should be closed. And it makes a triple seal. And then if you look down here, if I were gonna, I snored like crazy. And so if there was gonna be a side of obstruction that ended up as, as obstructive sleep apnea, that's where it would have been. All right, this is Karen Bonick's study of 4,000 British kids who are mouth breathers and snorers. And if you look, this is basically the development of the adenoid facies. The, the face develops vertically. The maxilla and the cheekbones don't develop. The, the sphenoid, the, the basic cranium ends up being too long and, and not wide enough. And the chin can't come forward because of the restriction of the maxilla. So I just use these points with a morphing software to put it on these pictures of me to make movies of before and after to see if there was any change. And so this is just showing a morphing of me getting about 30 years older and sicker. That's a sick man. Now, here's what I hoped would happen. It's okay to laugh. I can't hear you, but you're supposed to laugh here. I have to my mic on for that one. Okay. <laughs> here's what did happen. Here I am getting two years older. Watch These are more interesting when you watch them go back to the original and you see the, the scleral shine going away. You see the cheekbones growing. You see the bridge of my nose is growing. My facial color is better. Everything's a hell of a lot healthier. So yeah, difference. You can actually see my sphenoid growing here. It actually expanded laterally my basal cranium. I did not expect that to happen. So we grow in the air handler and the ductwork. Here you can see my tongue coming up. My sinuses are getting bigger. And my airway is getting a little better defined. Here you can see this is not tipping teeth. It's growing the maxilla, it's growing the alveolus, and it's taking the teeth along with it and keeping them upright. And if you look at the lower, you can see the same things happening. Mandible on the left side grew forward almost a millimeter and cured my joint problems on that side. So this, this is supposed to be a virtual endoscopy. It's hard to see, but this just shows the toning and the largening of my oropharyngeal airway. 
if you look at this, Ted Belfort did these scans on the Mayo Analyze 10 software. The green is my skull before treatment, and the red is where either a bone grew forward or grew in volume. So you can see that a 70-year-old man wearing appliances only at night, we were able to take the interrupted grown of the intramembranous bones of the craniofacial respiratory complex and expand them at almost age 70. And I was just astounded. Because we got to remember, this is the maxilla. If you ask Dennis where the maxilla is, they'll just look at the alveolar process with the teeth. This is the maxilla. Most of the bridge of the nose is the maxilla. So if you're going to expand the maxilla, you're going to grow support under the orbit. And if you look at the pictures of my eyes, you can see there's less sclera showing because those bones develop. And uh, developing the maxilla will give you a bigger airway and CBCT shows that. The, this is a picture of my left TMJ. The, it, I had a, the disc was displaced and I had erosion of the condyle and the meniscus. And you can see it's the disc is back in place and the bone is regrown there. So these, for 40 years, I had these purpuri on my ankles. And if you look at them up here, I would wrap my skin in cortisol paste, hoping these would heal, but they wouldn't. And they just bled and they bled for 40 years. Three years later, you can see they're almost completely gone with no treatment. Now they're 100% gone. Uh, and I had debilitating skin problems. So I don't have any of them anymore. So what's happened since then? I went from 242 pounds to 198. I now weigh 192. <clears throat> Pacemaker's helping. I don't have to take any hypertensive medicines anymore because I've got low blood pressure. The Crohn's disease is completely healed. No, no, no pain, no diarrhea uh, after damn near killing me for decades. My TMD problems are gone. Skin problems are gone. I don't have GERD anymore. I'm now a daytime habitual nasal breather. I can sleep well at night with only my mouth taped. I've still got a low ejection fraction. I've still got advanced heart failure. You can't win them all. They want to put in a pump. I'm not doing the pump. I'm glad to be here. But I feel as well as any old FAR to 77 has any right to. And I feel fortunate to be part of this quest. So my conclusion is you can develop an airway and, and get people to use, use that airway at any age, and they may get better. So back to the eyes have it. Here's Dave's cartoon. Here's the guy who is obviously sick as hell. And the doctor is oblivious to it because they need to be looking at it. This is a wonderful book Dave has just written. For anybody who wants to know anything about sleep apnea, anybody who has a family member who has sleep apnea, anybody on a CPAP who's having trouble dealing with it, they need to read this book. There's Dave when he was the bass player in our band. And we will be playing together on the Pullman Ops if he, uh, uh, AAPMD meeting in Orlando. You should definitely read James Nestor's book. He's done more to spread the word to the public because the key is we need to we need to educate every mother, wife, and uh, grandmother in the United States about this because they're the ones who see these things and make decisions. And as a layman, he has done more to take that message without an axe to grind. He's just done wonders for us. Every mother, grandmother, and wife should read uh, Paul Ehrlich's, uh, Sandra Kahn's book, Jaws. And it also has the best, I think, the most reproducible myofunctional therapy that you can actually do at home. All you have to do is eat with your kids and use proper table manners. And you can learn how to breathe, chew, and swallow correctly. The story of the human body. Sleep Interrupted by Stephen Park is the one that really got me started realizing that it's a lot more than just apnea. Patrick McEwen is the Buteco guy. He's got also good things about breathing. These are all resources that 
all of you should read if you have a chance to do it. So my father used to say more mistakes were made by not seeing than by not knowing. And you cannot unsee what the mind knows. Once you've seen the giant tongue and the problem of it, you can't unsee it. Once you've seen the truth about why people have these problems, then you get to the, to the ethical crossroads in your life where you say, do I embrace this and move forward with it and do the right thing? Or do I just ignore it and keep on fixing teeth? And that's why we have to have this at the beginning of dental school, at the beginning of ortho school, so everybody gets out of school knowing this. Because it's really hard to take somebody who's already busy, focused on just what they produce with their hands, and tell them to try to get connected to all these patients. It really needs to be done in an interdisciplinary, integrative clinic that has a whole team, everybody covering this, because one person can't do it. We have to have a team. We can't, the, our teamwork does more to help our patients than I do. I'm just a guy with a whistle who's trying to figure out a diagnosis and monitoring progress of the ball. So here's a, a cartoon, Pearls Before Swine. He says, when you look at the FedEx logo, do you see the word FedEx or the arrow? He says, there's no arrow, and then he sees it. Then he says, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So here's the FedEx arrow. I'm guessing half of you see FedEx, half of you don't see the arrow. All right, we'll come back to that later. Because it's all about what we have to do to look at stuff. So today's two take-home pearls. This is what I wanted to show to dentists who are already doing this, to give them two things to focus on that they may not be focusing on. It may give them the most information about what's really wrong with patients and a way to gauge the way they're getting better other than just a sleep test or, or something we can measure, uh, measure with instruments. First is, Follow the patient's symptoms. Second is, follow the patient's eyes. <clears throat> I got this from Ron Perkins, who was a classmate of mine in dental school, who's been practicing orthodontics in Dallas for 55 years, I guess. He's been growing airways on kids the whole time and catching heat from all the other orthodontists for treating early. But I took a course from him when I first started studying dental sleep medicine. And he said two things. At the very first appointment, make a complete inventory of related symptoms. And then as you treat the patient, follow those symptoms. Because out of sight, out of mind, they may forget they had those problems. So it can be very revelatory to see what those changes are. Secondly, look into the patient's eyes, get an idea of just looking at them. Do these people look sick to you? And then take pictures that day, along with all these other pictures. Then as you treat the patient, go back and follow up, and you may be astounded at some of the changes you see. Because what is the gold standard for outcome? It's not, what is your HI? It's, how are you sleeping? How do you look? How do you feel? And so that, these are ways of really <clears throat> getting to know the patient, engaging them, and really seeing how you're making progress. So Shakespeare said the eyes are the, are the window of the soul. This is the last patient I'll show you. And there's no question looking at his eyes, he's a sick man. If you look into this kid's eyes, he's obviously desperate. And if you look at this kid's eyes, he's obviously shocked or horrified. You don't need a label to see that. So these are some of the devices and materials we use. I'll talk about them a little more. This is the preventive oral appliance or the pod, saline spray, different types of tape. And this is a homey block. These are other devices. This was our first breathing trainer. Not a lot of people talk about toning the airway. If we're gonna get people to use, to use the airway they have, and we well know that mouth breathers have virtually no uh, muscle tone from the base of their eyes down to their sternum. That includes all of these muscles, including the smooth muscles of their airway, including an inactive diaphragm. If they're only chest breathing, intercostally breathing, not using their diaphragm, all of those muscles need to be taught how to work and tighten up. And so what is sleep apnea? Obstructive sleep apnea is a collapsible airway. What if you tone the airway to where it doesn't collapse? 
and you get the tongue out of the way. So maybe they don't need a bigger airway. Maybe they just need one that works better. So normally, this is how, and unfortunately, very few dentists make diagnostic casts. But we've been doing it for every patient for 50 years. But usually we hold them like this and look at the teeth. This is what we should be looking at. We should be taking the tongue's eye view of this. And we can see that in that, that tall palate up there, that, that very narrow area, there's not enough room for that tongue. So this is the preventive oral appliance or the pod. And it has a bite block that's put in on one side on um, the side of the patient's face that is less developed. And when you put it in, it all of a sudden gives you about three times as much room for your tongue. And so now the tongue can expand forward between the upper anterior teeth, between the, the uh, posterior teeth, and up into the palate. The tongue is a hydrostat, it's a water balloon. It wants to occupy any space that, that is available to it. There's a lot of talk about how you need to expand this maxilla on everybody, but I'm you know, beginning to think if we can get the tongue working right, it may be, they may not need as much expansion as we think, as much as getting their tongue to work the way it should. So this, these are the initial pictures we make for a new patient. You can see her eyes, how tired they are. And this is something we also make a movie of their swallowing. And you can see that she uses her facial muscles to swallow. And she's got a restricted tongue and her chief complaint is she just remarried and she has socially disrupted snoring, which is making a real problem uh, being in bed with her new husband. So she basically just wants to quit snoring. But we never, there's no such thing as simple snoring. Don't ignore it. Go ahead and do some metrics. Huh. Uh, so in her case, she, her three nights of oxymetry looked like she had flow limitation, but she had breakthrough avenues and hypotenuse which struck me as interesting. So we talked to her for about an hour and a half, giving her the basic information about what's going on, gave her some tape to use, told her to work on her, keeping her tongue in the roof of her mouth. And I went ahead and made impressions to make her a pot appliance. In the three weeks while the appliance was being made, she, her, she lost about half of her symptoms just from taping her mouth, trying to change her tongue position and sleeping on her side. So do we help people by giving them a gadget that solves the problem or a drug that treats the symptom? Or do we arm them with information they need so that they can heal themselves? She's incredibly better. I don't think she's gonna need her tongue released. So what does the pod do? It lifts the tongue, gives you a lot more room for your tongue. If you use it with tape, then it, it encourages the tongue to come up and forward and encourages the patient to breathe through their nose. It allows you to push your jaw forward to open the airway, but the teeth don't touch, so you can't wear the teeth with it. It also cannot change the bite, which all mandibular advancement appliances can. And if you make enough tap appliances or all of these, you're going to see a lot of people who have irreversible bite changes, and they're now orthodontic or surgical problems. So if we don't have to start with that, let's don't do that. It helps to let us know if the patient needs a phrenectomy. If they can mobilize their tongue enough by having more room and practice breathing through their nose, that may be all they need. But if they do need a phrenectomy, now they've got all this extra room, they've already done the exercises, they can get the tongue way up beyond at night where it needs to be with that pot in. Ideally, so that during the daytime, you take out the pod and the tongue stays in the roof of the mouth. So it's, it's like training wheels. It's a walk to wellness. We never know how much of this anybody needs. We just try one step at a time and don't get in a hurry. I've had CPAP patients who couldn't tolerate CPAPs. And we gave them a pod and taped their mouth shut and they were able to turn the CPAP down about 80% and, until we got them off the CPAPs. <clears throat> the bite block actually can begin bone growth, but not nearly as much as it can uh, with homeoblocks. We don't have time to talk about all that. 
I'm just showing you what I'm using. This is a simple device. The laboratory bill for it is $150. We can, if people have dental insurance, we can just charge it as a bruxism appliance to avoid the morass of medical billing. So if they clinch on that, it may uh, stretch the ligaments. Clinching on it may help in their airway, in the axial dimension. So the body may clinch the jaw to open the airway, but if they're clinching, if they're clinching with their mouth shut and they have TMD problems, they're clinching against a, a condyle disc assembly that's unhappy. If they're down and forward with this bite block in, even if they're clinching on it, the forces are reduced about 80% and the, and the jaw is relaxed so it can reperfuse itself at night. So you can do a lot treating tricky TMDs by just opening them at night with this. So it could do a lot of things for a simple device. This is what we're now using. It's an expiratory muscle trainer. Uh, Dave, you know, uh, Anders Olsen, who uh, developed this, you know about him. This may be the most important thing we do. We're dealing with structure, function, and behavior. And if we really want to get people using their diaphragm and breathing through their nose, they need to build up those reflexes, and build up that muscle. And they can drive around with this thing in their mouth. They can use it while they're reading. They can have it by TV. And all they have to do is exhale against resistance that makes them use their entire lung volume, strengthens their muscles, their airway, and conditions their diaphragm. Some people need to spray out at night. You really want to get your nose clear before you start taping. This is the team we use to treat these patients. I don't really have time to talk about it, but it takes a good myofunctional therapist, a surgeon who had to be browbeaten into doing his first phrenectomy. Now he's done about 300. He refuses to take out bicuspids for orthodontists. And the second patient he treated was his father. Uh, this is an orthodontist who is now no longer extracting teeth, but I still can't get him to treat three-year-olds. But now we've got one who will. And this is a chiropractor who's really helped our patients a lot. So these are people who help me with the patients I'm going to show you. So let's really quickly look at nine patients here. Treatment time, six to 18 months. Two of them started out with TAP appliances, but it didn't work, so we quit. So none of these were actually treated with TAP appliances. Seven of them had phrenectomies and OMT. All of them are a hell of a lot better. And if you look at those nine patients, between them, they have over 100 symptoms that they had pre-treatment that they don't have anymore. So how many medicines is that that they're no longer taking? So let's look at the eyes of these people. This is a little girl who was sent to me by a psychiatric resident at the medical school, ADHD. You can see on the top picture, she's just sweating like crazy. She snores, sleep with her mouth open, makes Fs at school, has behavior problems. We released her tongue. She did my functional therapy with Paula. Uh, she's off her ADHD meds. She's making A's and B's. She doesn't snore and she breathes through her nose. That took about eight months. Here's a teenager, 16-year-old athlete, resting pulse 100. He's adrenalized 24 hours a day. He's got GERD. He has oppositional defiant disorder. He's been thrown out of three schools for his behavior and makes Fs. So we released his tongue, put him on a pod, did myofunctional therapy. All of his symptoms are gone. His resting pulse rate is 65 now. And he's gone from being what his mother called my bad son to my wonderful son, who is now in graduate school. So teaching him to breathe, chew, and swallow changed the entire trajectory of his life at age 16. Now here's Richard. This is one of those patients. He'd been a patient of mine since he was 16 years old. He had to get 40 years old for me to look in his eyes and go, damn, Richard, you're not breathing well. So he, he clenched his teeth all night, woke up with headaches, had morning headaches and back pain, uh, and had irritable bowel syndrome. And so we put him on a pot appliance and had him tape his mouth shut. And look at the difference in his eyes. Okay, here he is first day. Look at him waking up. This is five months. And five of his symptoms are gone. 
Very simple treatment. He still needs his tongue release, but he won't do it. And most men are like that. This is a lady who, uh, Dave, you sent her to me. It's Nova Dawn. Uh, she had apnea. She couldn't work. She wore a tap appliance, but it gave her jaw pain. And when we see that, we know they have a restricted tongue. So we released her tongue. She did myofunctional therapy. She had been a four bicuspid ortho extraction case. So uh, Dr. Graff opened all, all opened her face back up. Uh, we put in implants and restored her. And you can just see, uh, I don't want that. Well, it's not gonna play again. Uh, she looks like a totally different person. And she had, I believe, 27 symptoms that are all gone. And she grew a new face, grew some lips. And her first picture, I can't go back to it, but she was just pale as a ghost. Here's a lady who was sent to me by the chiropractor. She had, she did not have sleep apnea. She had flow limitation, but she couldn't sleep worth a damn. Uh, so again, put her on the pod, got her taped, did the phrenectomy, a little bit of OBMT and her chiropractor worked with her. And in three months, she just happened to drive by. This is three months. This is made in the same room with the same camera. That's a different person. Watch her go. We really see it when we watch them go back. We see how sick and tired they were. And as we bring it forward, we can see just by looking in their eyes and their faces that they're better. And they're all better. Dave, you probably know this gentleman. He's a physiatrist, a rehabilitative medicine doctor. He had 20 symptoms. He uh, had bradycardia. He had. He thought he had uh, Lou Gehrig syndrome. Uh, he flatlined in his cardiologist's office when they were doing a carotid massage. He sweated so much at night, he'd have to wake up and change his clothes three times at night. So we weren't releasing tongues then. We did it at the end of his treatment. We just put him on a pod and tape and myofunctional therapy. I mean, a homeoblox. Homeoblox tape and myofunctional therapy. And this is 18 months. And that's some pretty drastic changes, not only in his eyes, but his cheekbones are growing, his lips are growing, his entire facial color is changing. I mean, there he has the face of a sick man. So when I first started making these movies, some of them just made me break down in tears. And some of them made me just fall out of my chair because I had just been taking the pictures and never put them together. So if you follow their eyes and you make these pictures, you can get a really good idea of how you're really helping people. Here you can see he had a very low tongue posture and he learned to do this without having his tongue released. And his airway gets much better toned. Now, this is an interesting one. If you look, Dave, look at the stuff in the sinus here. Look at these congested uh, turbinates here. You might think he might need some surgery. Tom, um, did, he, did he have sinusitis type symptoms too? Yes. Here you can see his tongue coming up. You can see his maxilla expanding. Look at the change in his nasal capsule. Why don't you go back to what it was? Mine did the same thing. Uh, the volume, my turbinates got smaller. Part of it's disuse, you know, nasal disuse syndrome. Part of it is it, it actually grows if you grow the maxilla. So there's a, probably the biggest lecturer in dental sleep medicine is Jeff Rouse. And he says, don't even talk about medicine. This is not medicine. This is sleep dental prosthodontics. Well, I ask you, is this dentistry or medicine? Is there a difference between dentistry and medicine anymore? I don't think there is. I think it's time for us to embrace each other and move forward, lay down our egos at the door and say, all right, here's our team. This particular patient, what problem do they have with which I can help working with the rest of them?
and not wanting to own it the way pediatrics, pediatrics wants to own pediatric sleep apnea. The only two recommendations for pediatric sleep apnea are tonsil TNA, which will help for a while, but unless you change the way that kid's breathing, they're gonna be sicker later. So it's a stopgap message uh, uh, method. And the only other option they have is CPAP. You're gonna put a five-year-old in a CPAP? So the pediat pediatrician should say, go to any orthodontist who can do a simple, simple two-dimension expansion. And if you do that, you'll probably fix 80% of those kids. That's why we need to stop being in our towers, owning what we think is a disease when there are others who can help the patient. Because it, is it about us or is it about the patient? So here's my last patient. I'm sorry if I've taken so long. This is how Melton looked when he was 40 years old. Uh, I've known him forever. He's not my patient, but he's, his wife is my wife's best friend. And we had him over for dinner and he started telling me his medical history. This is what he looked like after we treated him. He had had five heart attacks. The first four he thought was indigestion. So he just took enough Tums until it went away and thought, well, the next one I'll go to the hospital. With the fifth one, he woke up in the hospital. They put in stents, the stents collapsed, and he, they put in more stents, and they were collapsing. He had uncontrolled, he had had a, a sleep study, but wouldn't wear a CPAP. He was just the sickest person I could see. He was dying. And I said, let me see if I can help you. And we could see he's got a red oropharynx. They took out some teeth. He's got a restricted tongue. So we sent him home with some oximetry. And even though it's illegal for a dentist to look at an oximeter and say, damn, that's big, bad sleep apnea, that's big, bad sleep apnea. So he sent him for a sleep test at the medical school. And his HI was 84, highest HI I've ever seen. So he's trying to die 84 times a night because he can't breathe. So we put him on the pod with the CPAP and the tape at first so he could start breathing at night. Start see what it feels like to actually breathe better. Did a phrenectomy in the OMT. He used one of those breathing exercisers all day long, every day. He worked with a chiropractor now that he could breathe through his nose, learned to stand up straight, changed his diet. Now all he needs is a pod and tape. So here he is at the beginning. And here he is now. Just look at the complete change in the color of his face, especially watch him as he goes back. It looks like watching a man die. That's a dead man. And it's been five years, he's doing great. So my goal really, I'm retired from dentistry. I don't have any debt. I don't have to do this to make money. Uh, all we're trying to do is to figure out how to help people. And my goal is for the people I care about, I saw two friends, a friend and his wife today, they both got sleep apnea. Uh, if I can help the people I love get better, that's really all I care about because we can all do this. So here's, it, I'll be through this in a few minutes. He no longer snores, his eyes are healed. He's got all kinds of energy level, doesn't have GERD anymore. Used to wake up with a backache. He was on any uh, psychotics, didn't take them anymore. He lost 36 pounds. His daytime pulse dropped 10. His chronic knee pain went away. Blood pressure normalized at 115 over 70. Night sweats went away. He went from peeing three times at night to one. Got his obesity under control. His cholesterol dropped 100 points. No restless sleep. And he's no longer diabetic. And I once rebelled when crazy dentist from Colorado said, uh, what was his name? Huggins, Al Huggins. He said, if you guys, a dentist, have a patient who's got diabetes and their physicians won't help them, you need to help them as a dentist. And I thought that was the most irresponsible thing I'd ever heard in my life. And yet, here we are. <laughs> I mean, we did not go into this to cure his diabetes, but damn if it didn't. Also, his AHI was 84. 
1.7 now. Now, he tried to sign up for this Ornish Lifestyle Medicine Program, and they wouldn't take him. They said he was too healthy. And two years before, he was circling the drain. So does age really matter? Here's an 85-year-old man after three months of uh, wearing a pod and tape and having his tongue released. So it doesn't matter how old you are. And that's what I found out treating myself. And it changed my view of the entire thing. And it, it changed my view away from management strategies. Management strategies are great to get keep them from dying tonight. But if we can get at the upstream causes of the chronic inflammatory disease, we can treat that and the patient's physiology can fix itself. Unpredictable, you gotta have the right patient. You gotta have the time with them. But this is the most gratifying thing that's ever happened to me in my life. So here's an ad for a local eye doctor showing where he's tightened up the skin around the eyes of these people surgically. But if you look at their eyes, they're still sick. All right, here are three patients I just showed you. None of them had any surgery, and their eyes not only look better, they're well. So, you know, the, the face is just a mask hung on the skeleton. So if we can develop the skeleton, the face goes back to its normal dimensions. So did you see the arrow in the FedEx now? We've talked about what to look at and what to see. There it is. So my anecdotal conclusion, having gone 20 minutes over time, thank, thanks for letting me do this. I, was, I always show up with too much material. I can't help it. The story's just so big, I, I get on sidetracked by actually thinking. Uh, it's possible to develop a functional airway and teach people to use it at any age. That's all I got. Wow. The, the applause uh, is thunderous. <laughs> Fantastic. No, not at all. I told you that we're super laid back. We're not strict at all over here. So you can go as over as you would like. Dr. Tom Colquitt. You know, I remember the first time I ever heard you, and I feel the same way today. My brain was just. <laughs> That's what's like, happened what to my it? brain. <laughs> That's why I have to speed read bad crime novels just to, so I don't think about this shit. Which is oh, totally, yeah. Once you see this stuff, every it it it's like I was taught to fix one tooth pretty well until those guys showed me about how the jaw worked. And so it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> look what I've been missing. And so I thought for the next 40 years, I'm the best damn dentist in the world because I got to hear, not realizing the reason people's mouths were destroyed was because they couldn't breathe, chew, and swallow. So once you learn that, you go, oh, my God. It's, and I, it's and I love that. And it's I love everywhere. that every time you talk about it, you also talk about chew and swallow. Not a lot of dentists, you know, talk about how important myofunctional therapy is whenever we're looking at everything. We have so many questions coming in. Do you have a few more minutes to I've answer got, some of these questions? I've got as long as I stay alive unless my drugs quit working. Okay. <laughs> and I also Might have like a little to... wild turkey though. Nice. <laughs> I would like to invite also, uh, I saw Dr. Daniel Lopez was here and he answered a question earlier. You're welcome to turn your camera on Dr. Daniel Lopez and Dr. Dave, you're welcome. Welcome to also hang out and answer some questions. Um, we love collaboration here. So let me go back up top. Nicole was asking, is airway connected to poor eyesight? Dr. Daniel Lopez, so. are you still in the house? I absolutely think so. And there's really a wonderful little child I wanted to show that Paula treated with Buteco breathing. Uh, this kid's three years old. She's got all kinds of behavior problems. She breathes through her mouth. She's sick. She's got eyeglasses on, three years old. So Paula worked with her and worked with her. I mean, she wouldn't even, I scared the hell out of her. She wouldn't even look at me because I scare little bitty kids. I'm seven feet tall. <laughs> but she finally got to where she'd come down and talk to me as she was walking up and down the hall with her mouth tape shut. And then when I looked at all the pictures of it at the end of it, I thought, okay. Why didn't she have these problems? She wasn't breastfed. She didn't have baby led weaning. She had a restricted tongue. So not only did her palate 
and nasal capsule did not grow wide enough. Neither did her basic cranium. So when you consider the maxilla is the base of half the orbit that, that houses the eye. And if you consider looking at my results, where I actually grow bone here, I really think I wanted to say, take that child to an orthodontist and expand her upper arch. And I bet it'll fix her eyesight problems because her eyes are too damn close together. Wow. Now, I'm just... I'm just a dentist who could barely fix teeth. I'm not going to be talking about <laughs> ophthalmic problems. And every time I look at that kid's picture, I think if we expand her, I better fix her eyesight. Everything wow. depends on everything else. And as, as uh, Sandra Kahn says in Jaws, everything in the play, everything in the face deserves its space. I'm going to try it again. Everything in the face deserves its place in space. And that includes the eyeballs, the nose, maxilla, the ears, everything. Yes. Uh, so Dr. Know. Daniel Lopez is not here anymore, but he said uh, to that question, he said, yes, the pala made up is made up of the maxillary and palatine bones and make up the orbit, exactly what you're saying. If there is a high arch palate, the orb orbit will be affected as well, and that will affect normal function of the eyes. Thank you so much for um, helping us out with these. Um, Let's see. There's some questions People about are waiting each other. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, we're still. That's interesting. Doctor Lopez and I had the, basically the same answer. Yes, exactly. That's interesting, right? It's, it's, you know what we call that is coalescence of the bullshit. When it <laughs> happens, it makes you very happy. It makes you think you may be right. But because two of you agree, that doesn't mean either one of you are right. <laughs> but Keith Thornton um, and I are together, and people are talking to us. He'll say, when you talk to us, half of what we're going to tell you is correct. We just don't know which half. <laughs> so much of what we're doing here is guesswork, extrapolation, uh, mm -hmm. theor theorizing. There you go. Uh, we but have another question. Fun. It, 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 it beats the hell out of filling the same hole every day. Right? <laughs> Can a general dentist make a pod or does an orthodontist have to do it? No, any dentist. Okay, so all do you, you think is, so? All you need is a lower impression. And we use Dr. Belfour's software. It's called the, the camera, where you put the patient's picture in there, and it does an analysis that shows you which side of the patient's face is less developed. And you put wow. the bite block on that side, especially with the homeo blocks. Because what that does, there are the two things that grow the complex are breastfeeding and proper pressure, constant pressure from the tongue, and then unilateral chewing of hard food, one side and then the other. That creates what's called mechanotransduction. It's the, if you look at a bone density study on a baseball pitcher, his arm that he pitches with will be twice as dense as the other one because it's constantly in motion. So if you constantly chew on one side, it turns that mechanical energy into electrical energy, goes up into the face, turn, activates the stem cells, and, and uh, initiates growth at the sutures. Wow. So that's why if somebody is off on one side, you put the bite block on that side. You can see in my pictures in, in that article, the whole deal was how my face got more symmetrical. And that's because we intentionally tried to grow the less, less symmetric side. Wow. And, that, and may, that, that may just be an accident. That may not be <laughs> any scientific basis to that. It's just what happened. Somebody had a question about expansion in adults. Uh, what's your opinion on expansion after a person is a teenager? Because there are mixed reviews earlier is better, which is true, but you had a successful expansion. So what are your thoughts? On this end, and it's not a yes and no opinion, actually. Well, first, <laughs> earlier is always better. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier. I mean, <clears throat> look at me. I'm. We were driving down the highway in Florida to nephew's wedding, and I could see where all the trees had been blown over to one side by the prevailing winds. So here's a tree all bent over to one side. That was me, seventy-year-old tree. We're trying to oh, straighten this thing. Well, if you've got a twig. Is it a little easier to straighten up that twig? 
So earlier is always better, and your your window is from two to seven. And orthodontists don't see them until they're 13, it's too late. So uh, if, yes, uh, expand at any age if it's necessary. And there are all kinds of good ways to do it. Ben Miraglia does incredible things with Invisalign. Yeah. Uh, um, trying to think of her name, works with Kevin. Mariana Evans. Yeah. Uh, does fantastic. the the combination of uh, 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 micro implant orthodontics mm-hmm. where she expands it and then she has to do orthodontics to close the space. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got an orthodontist now who says he can expand three of my adult patients without implants and without surgery. Wow. So, so what yes. kind of appliances are they using? Is, do you think I, it really it really expands know. the suture? I don't know. He's just now, I've got three adult patients over there now that he, he swears two things. One, I'm going to be the orthodontist who can expand adults without doing all this surgery. And number two, I'm going to be the orthodontist that shows a busy orthodontist can do this and treat kids. Wow. That's what we need. Boy, that, they're the key to the whole thing. They are the key. Wow. But they don't want to hear it. Now, Barry Rayfield wants to hear it. He wants to treat it to everybody. He tried to he was asked to lecture at the University of Washington. And they said, yeah, come out and talk to us. You don't talk about any of that stuff you do. We don't want to hear it. We've already uh, closed our minds to it. And so right. that's, that's the problem. Yes, it is. Here, here's Angela. where we are right now. <clears throat> I used to have a lecture series that talked a lot about analog, analogs between what we're doing and uh, the evolution of airplanes and flight. So where we are right now and what we're able to diagnose and do to fix people is right about where the spirit of St. Louis was. You know, it was the first plane to make it across the Atlantic. But that was just early on in the evolution of learning more and more about more effective, simpler. And the the big problem we have is is the way uh, everything is set up to disseminate information through uh, uh, literature. There's been so many studies. I mean, it was it the head of the Lancet or the New, Gen- uh, New England Journal of Medicine who said 50% of publications you see are bullshit? You can't believe them because they're, they're a lot are doing confirmation bias for the drug companies that are paying for the studies. So there's the problem with that. The other problem is if you got 50 kids who are sick, how do you withhold treatment from 25 of them and treat the other 25 so that you can create a randomized double blind controlled study? So, and who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it? Who's paying for that kind of stuff? So, and Dave knows that's out there. And Dave wants, he's trying to put his foot in there to slowly let the medical people understand that we're on to something without pushing away the, the rock from the tomb too quickly. Is that mm-hmm. accurate, Dave? Uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's as good as any explanation, Tom. You know, um, it, it's a, it's a uh, I kind of think of this technology as developing in parallel with the traditional Western medicine. Uh, this, this technology developed as sort of an engineering mindset so it's a it's a deconstruction of the problem and an engineer's mind put to it and um that sort of technology tends to develop faster but it also tends to develop without any outcomes data and that's where we are is that we need to start getting things published um and even if it's only case series at this point rather than a randomized controlled trial we need to find out what happens to a whole cohort of people going forward so I think that's really what I'm interested in helping promote. Well, and it's going to take that for our, I mean, Jim Metz has been saying that for years. We're not going to legitimize this in medicine until we can, uh, they won't believe it until they see it in print. You know, whether it's right or not, it's got to be in print. And, and that has to be done. Angela, do you going to ask your question? Yes, yeah, sure. I had a question come in, um, Dr. Colquitt. When you're using the, the homeo block, are you also prescribing or recommending any type of cranial sacral therapy or physical therapy during treatment? That's a good question. I know that's a, a really interesting 
subject. There is a retired periodontist who I think had to quit practice because everybody thought he was crazy. And what he does is he works in Amish country in the basement of a, a co-op and he sees newborns. And he can take a newborn and by the things he does with craniosacral touching, he can he says he can take a V-shaped uh, Gothic arch in a newborn and convert it to a Roman arch in five minutes. Now, if it's possible that early in life, he says if he sees a 10-year-old patient, he says, damn, you're here about 10 years too late. If, if it's possible to, and what is that? That's just what you're talking about. So if it's possible to have that kind of profound effect on a newborn, so as you take the entire trajectory of their life and aim it in the right direction in the first minutes, why the hell aren't we doing that? Yeah, I know that Mark and, and Barry and a lot of them are very interested in craniosacral therapy. Uh, I have a brilliant friend, Buddy Landry, who is my muscular therapist, who's taught me so much about muscles. He thinks it's self-hypnosis, although I have patients who've had it who say they're a lot better. So what we really need more than anything, I believe, is a hell of a lot more osteopaths, mm -hmm. not chiropractors, not craniosexual therapies. We need a shitload of osteopaths. Yeah. They understand this stuff. They can manipulate the temporal bone. That article, Dave, you're showing about rotating these bones. They can do that. Yeah. So they should be doing it. But most of them go to osteo school so they can practice medicine. And <laughs> they end up not doing any of this. So that is I, so true. And I don't have a local craniosacral person, but I have a lot of patients I've sent to that chiropractor who really is way above the average chiropractor. And is, I have a lady with a really bad sleep apnea. Uh, I never could get her off her CPAP, but he was able to get her to open her mouth 75% more just through what he did. Wow. That's incredible. We have yeah. a comment over here on Facebook. Kendra said, after my son's expansion, he went from a six and a half to a three and three and a half prescription in less than one year. So it does affect your eyesight. Isn't that insane? Doctor? No, I think it makes absolute sense. <laughs> right? I, I know we say that we're sense. not all talking you can about do everything it. you can to engineer the proper phenotype that corresponds to the ideal genotype, then you have the best chance of kids not having any of these problems. The problem is epigenetics is that so much of this, I mean, you may have had grandparents who had the biggest cheekbones in the world. And then you may all of a sudden have a grandchild who's chinless. And Kevin has a lot of explanation about how that could happen. And they're not treated. So they end up being class four malocclusion, bioretronathic, sick as hell. It changes, epigenetically changes the expression of their DNA and they pass it on to the next generation. And that's mm -hmm. what we're seeing now. It's yeah. the fastest negative evolutionary change in humankind. Our faces are flattening faster than anything that's ever happened. At the same time, we're getting fatter, stupider. Uh, kids, 40% of kids diagnosed with ADHD, 50% of kids are obese. The IQ has fallen 10 points per generation. And that's a lot of that's epigenetics. Wow. I think Dave may correct me. Mm -hmm. He made a comment what do you about think, Dave? dentists who talk about epigenetics the other day. <laughs> uh, I agree with every word you said, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um guys let me go we have a couple more questions but i think um we might ask i just want to go ahead and talk to you guys really quickly about what's going on on airway circle before we ask two more questions how about that first we have a brand new directory and we need your help uh that's just going to help you we send patients there every day so if you want to be found please uh go to members.airycircle.com slash directory do not use Airy Circle uh, directory right now, the regular website. So you have to type members first. Members.airycircle.com slash directory. Go ahead and add your listing. We had over 70 people here tonight. We better have about 70 new listings overnight. So I'm going to look it up 
and I'll come after you. There you go. Angela just posted the link um, on the chat box. Think about that um, for that, Angela. So what do we have going on? I'm in the wrong file. Um, next Thursday, we have Kimberly Bankert live on uh, the 19th. Uh, we have our uh, another in-person state chapter meeting, and it's going to be in upstate New York. Uh, the state leader, Dana Moon, is Dana here? Uh, she's going to be doing an in um, a local state chapter meeting. And if you guys are interested to having a, a local study club meeting, Aries Circle would love to help with that. Uh, we are really encouraging everybody to have a local meeting this year, and we want to be part of it. So just let us know how we can help. We have our ACBC book club. Uh, you might like this one, Dr. Coquit. <laughs> it's called Airy Circle Book Club with Dr. Shireen Lim. Uh, she's the author of Breathe, Sleep, and Thrive. It's going to be on the 22nd of January at 7 p.m. Um, what else we have going on? Circle Time is our study club. We're going to be sh sharing. Uh, this is all about case sharing. So case studies. It's going to be on the 21st of February at 8 p.m. And it's going to be fantastic. Very soon, I'm going to release who the speakers are going to be. We're going to have more than one speaker. It's going to go about on for about two hours. Uh, we would like for you guys to invite professionals that you know to join our Facebook group. It's called Aries Circle Professionals. So everybody can stay informed on the next um, speakers. If you have not joined us yet, uh, you can go to our website, click on members and join now and take advantage of everything that we have put together for you guys. Um, two more questions and we are ready. You want to do that? Sure. I'm your whore. All right, Angela, do you see anyone that you want to ask? I'm sorry. I, I just can't help it. You know, I really want to behave, but it's just not in my character. <laughs> That's why I like you. <laughs> All so right, let's no, see. No, uh, Angela, do you have a specific one that you've seen? You let me oh. know. What are some symptoms you may consider inconsequential? Um, no, let's see. Uh, gaps in knowledge or... Is your, in your experience, what is a good approach to consider when trying to impact our knowledge of airway health and red flags? We identify to other providers in the dental space, even pediatricians or ENTs who are not enlightened in your experience. What is a good approach to consider when trying to impart our knowledge of airway health and red flags we identify to these other providers? Boy, that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Ann. <laughs> if I were 30 years younger, I'd be all over trying to make that happen. And I would start with the pediatric dentist first. And then I'd go to the pediatricians. Um, the best way to, to enlighten one is to get one as your patient and fix them. <laughs> if you really want to know that. There you go. I'm not going to call up a guy I don't know and take him to lunch and try to Agreed. show him the 10,000 slides I've put together over 20 years and right? explain the big picture of all of this. This it's, is a common question that, that uh, a lot of know, our friends... There's just you know, so friends. many battles you can fight. Yeah. The best that's way what I is, started doing. The best way is to have them as your patients, mm -hmm. whether they got our airway patients or not. And you already know them. So take them to lunch, talk about it, show them your passion, let them know this, this is the biggest problem in this country and that it is, doesn't seem right, the dentistry. And here's the problem. And God bless Dave McCarty. Uh, the fact that we, you know, we worked together for 10 years, he disappeared to Colorado, now we're back together as brothers again. It's just wonderful. He's yeah. written this book. He is the sleep doctor who's going to cross over the aisle and embrace us and try to build a bridge between medicine and dentistry, which we really need. Uh, damn, I lost that track of thought. It was really going along pretty well, too. <laughs> Thank you for whoever, who is this? They just tagged us on Instagram. Houston, my functional therapy. Thank you so, so much. There you go. There's you. You are yeah. famous. You're on Instagram right now. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This really helps. I mean, sharing, you know, that's a seed that you're planting that somebody might see it and know to come uh, check out all those webinars that we're putting together for you guys. Oh, uh, let me go back to where that train of thought was. 
Yes. What I found out from working with sleep doctors for 10 years, they know a shitload about sleep. They don't know anything about breathing. They don't understand breathing. Uh, my wife wore a CPAP for a number of years. All right, here's how you should breathe. I'm going to breathe in for six to eight seconds. Then I'm going to breathe out for six to eight seconds. And I'm not going to breathe again until I need to. So. That's how we should be breathing 24 hours a day. Here's what a CPAP does. Your body goes, what the hell is that? How am I supposed to survive with that? That's not the way my body works. So even the people who design the instruments to treat breathing don't understand breathing. I think dentists and myofunctional therapists and us are the only ones who have a handle on how, it's how you breathe and what you breathe through that matters. And I don't think I don't think physicians have a clue. Mm -hmm. That is, is so really true. Sad. Yeah. Because these I are ideally to. medical problems, but who's really all right? Who's going to treat the fifty percent of breathing problems who have skinny girl disease, who have UARS? who have 29 symptoms and have an AHI of zero. Yeah. Who's going to treat them? Physicians won't treat them. Insurance won't pay to treat them. Should we wait until, in my view, it's like, say, here's what sleep medicine is like and the insurance. We're going to build a cancer clinic. Okay, we're going to be a good cancer clinic. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to ignore pre-malignant lesions. Even if the patient comes in and says, look at this, we're going to say, oh, all you need is a little skin hygiene. You'll be okay. So we let them get sicker and sicker and sicker yeah. until they have the end stage metastatic class four, stage four cancer. Because now we can make a diagnosis and insurance will pay to treat them. So we're going to wait until you're damn near dead to identify your problem and actually treat it. Where when we said earlier, Earlier is always better. And mm -hmm. the only people who are thinking that way is us. Yeah. And it needs to be all of us. And there's, as Dave would say, there's one sleep doctor for every 50,000 patients in the United States. So how many patients are actually going to make it to a sleep doctor? But how many patients see their dentist or their hygienist twice a year? We're exactly. the sentinels. The hygienists are the ones who should be seeing it. And then somehow the doctor has to figure out how to set up ancillary help so the patients can get the treatment they need so he can still make his Porsche payment by making 50 crowns a month. That's oh, a wow. transitional problem right now. That is Sorry true. if I'm a little cynical, but I've been around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. People are going crazy about tonight's lecture. Uh, some, uh, Tara said, thank you so much for tonight's presentation, Dr. Colquitt. This was absolutely amazing. I feel inspired by your work. Many thanks for taking the time and energy to share this. It's such important work. Have a wonderful night, everyone. I'm going to um, do a little dance. That's yeah. the whole point of this. And let me tell you about you. I made the decision in 1976 to either quit being a dentist or to learn occlusion and all that went along with that. And so when I started learning it, it was one of those when the pupil is ready, the world's best dentist taught me everything I needed to know over about a 10 year period. And the guy who was in his nephology, which is a study of the jaw, which in interestingly studied everything in detail except breathing and action of the <laughs> tongue. And if that had been in there, it, would, it took a while for that to catch. But the, the main teacher was Charlie Stewart, who taught all over the world, had multiple study clubs, and he taught Bill McCarris, who recently died, who was one of my best friends, who had 50 study clubs all over the world. And Charlie told Bill, he said, all right, you get, and when we were in Atlanta at the Hinman, I was astounded at how many people were in that room, because it was the last lecture on the last day. And I thought, well, I'll be lucky if there are a handful. There were 250 people in that room. Wow. And they didn't leave. 
And yet what Charlie told Bill was, you're going to give a lecture. You got a hundred dentists who have already said they commit to doing the right thing. We call it taking the harder right over the easier wrong. Because once you've seen something, what are you going to do? Are you going to do the right thing or just ignore it? He said, so they may listen to you for two days. And you're going to go home thinking, I just taught 200 people to do the right thing. He said, no, if you're lucky, one of them will do it. Wow. If you're lucky, one in a hundred will get it. And that's you. <laughs> that's what just makes my heart swell with pride. And look Thank what you're you. doing. Do you guys understand, though, how inspirational he is? How incredible. I can't help it. I'm just a crazy man on fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I absolutely love it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I could not do anything that I'm doing if it wasn't with every single person that's in the room right now. If it wasn't for you, for inspiring me and pushing me to well, really just opening my brain to go like, oh, my gosh, there's so much more that I can be doing for my patients. Well, uh, I'll, either, and... I'll either sleep really well tonight or just stare at the ceiling all night. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so Thanks. much for the opportunity. Thank you. We want you to get good rest. I so look forward to meeting all y'all someday. Yes, yes, around. definitely. You guys stay up to date with our um, Area Circle Facebook group because we're always posting over there the next um, conferences and what's going on. And now with these uh, state leader groups, you guys might to meet us a lot sooner than later. So uh, let us know if you want to start your study club. We'll be happy to help. Thank you okay, so much. Great. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Forever grateful. Bye. Thank you.